uh, the, and it was uh, Haitian immigrants in particular that were really the first non-white people that were humanized to me and experiencing their pain and suffering up close. Uh, and then slowly I started to a ask, how, how bad must it be in Haiti that the best option is to risk losing your life at sea? And then the weeks and months went on and we were pulling into port calls in uh, uh, Cartagena, Colombia and Golfito, Costa Rica and Rodman, Panama and other places. And at 18 and following in the footsteps of our leadership, um, going into uh, a, a brothel at 18 years old following, I think our doc uh, went and not being want, uh, not, not wanting to be labeled a uh, um, I don't know, not, not, what, to, to prove my masculinity, I guess, I had to go with the flow, and in the repric in, in after, after that, uh, along with Catholic guilt from my childhood, I uh, felt awful, and I started to think about who this woman was and how she wound up there, and, and that's something that's not talked about in terms of militar mil militarism and all of the unaffected, the affected victims in these countries where the U.S. Empire has been for a long time. And while that was going on, my friends were getting shipped off to Iraq and Afghanistan because the Coast Guard recruiter lied, and it turns out it was going to be... No, a, uh, um, We were going to be invading other countries, not zipping around, protecting the Port of Miami and New York and whatnot. So I did paperwork, tried to get out and swap over to a different branch. They wouldn't let me. An admiral denied it, and I had to finish out my time, and then I swapped over to the Army National Guard, and in 2007 and eight was in Iraq and got out and went to UMass Boston shortly thereafter. And it was while I was, uh, while I was um, in, in Iraq in 2007, 2008, and when I was there was when Blackwater killed seven, I think 17 people. And realizing that these were just people like my family, like anyone else, like these Haitians that I had met. And, that, and then I came home not feeling good about myself, knowing that we didn't do anything to protect any of my friends and family, and that's why I joined. I loved God, family, and country at that point. I still love my country, but Mark Twain said I should have loyalty to my country always and to the government when it deserves it. And more and more, I realized that the government doesn't deserve it, and quite frankly, from what I've read of history, it has uh, never really deserved it, and that's the government, not the country, and people get those confused and they mix them up. And uh, so anyhow, to wrap this up, I, at UMass Boston, I met a lot of amazing folks, um, members of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Uh, they had a speak out on campus, and I found myself nodding at everything they were saying and, and agreeing. And one of those guys speaking out, my buddy Mike, is in med school now in Philly, and he's one of my best friends. And I credit him and Carlos and Gabe and Liam and Ian and all of them for taking me in like a brother and really welcoming me back into their community and then through that uh, Paul Atwood who studied under Howard Zinn introduced me to a real version of American history and then uh, was a, I was spent time in a paddy wagon and locked up with VFP from Boston during Occupy Boston and uh, moved to Hawaii to save my sanity and lived off the grid and now, and now here I am and currently in the Bay Area about to be heading off to Europe to backpack travel around the world and uh, when I heard about this, I had to come here because these machines are creating far more enemies than anything else I can think of because it's, we're so far removed. When a man or a woman can sit behind a joystick and kill people thousands of miles away, and they have the statistics on that, and it's disturbing, and then go home and kiss their babies to, to good night or coach their son's little league team, that's... That's sad, and, and, I, and we have nothing against these folks. I have, I have one of my close friends is uh, still an officer in the military, and, and we understand what the, the position these folks are in and what got them into the military. Our generation wasn't drafted. We enlisted, and we understand what drove them, and that's a love of country, and the government let us down, and 22 of us kill ourselves statistically, according to the VA, every single day, and the government continues to let us down, and we're letting down our fellow man all around the world. And that's why I'm here, because uh, because the little, little the people in all these villages can't be here because they're being blown up by drones. And uh... thank you. Um, I just have to say before we um, started with um, Gary, you guys are just so bold and brave um, for for what you do. Um, I don't know how 
how you do it, actually, but I just see nothing but just such integrity and strength and character. Um, so yours, yours is going to be a, a three-part question. Uh, Gary Eggleston from Iraq Veterans Against the War. Please tell us why you joined and what changed your mind about war, the military in general, and then also what in particular, why are you here? Why drones? Um, I grew up in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, really, you know, I came from poor parents. Didn't really have a lot of options after high school. Uh, ran with some, you know, uh, people we got involved in some pretty heavy stuff. So basically it was, you know, the poverty draft. Uh, didn't really have any other options to, to escape Kentucky. And I thought that, you know, if I stayed there, then uh, good things wouldn't happen. And that hypothesis later proved correct. So uh, I, I joined the military to escape Kentucky you know, and not end up in, you know, bad circumstances as an adult. Uh, and then what changed my mind was, I remember the first night of shock and awe. Uh, I was living in the dorm, I was 18, and in the in the dorms, in the military base, uh, they had like a, a room with a huge green TV and a pool table. And that was the most packed that I've ever seen that room. Uh, people in there, you know, drinking uh, beer, there's huge amounts and partying like this was something to be celebrating uh, as bombs fell on innocent people and it really like gave me a wheezy sick feeling that uh, everyone was so excited to rush to war and and to watch innocent people being murdered so that kind of made me question things but then when I landed in Baghdad there was you know they had the big concrete blocks all around the bases in case mortars came in to prevent shrapnel there was uh, Baghdad International Airport a huge mural on the wall that had the twin towers on it and it said 9-11 why we're here which was you know a complete joke because I you know 9-11 had nothing to do with Iraq but uh, just the level of propaganda false propaganda promotion being put on by the military and as soon as you step off the plane to see that along with you know innocent people being killed and being celebrated just started making me question um, a lot of things, and I and I was young and naive then, thought it was all political and Bush was in office, and I'm like, oh, it's all Bush's fault, and I uh, just started reading uh, more center leftist material, and then from that I grew to read a lot more leftist material, and, and until eventually, you know, I became uh, anti-war, and I, I realized the history of the U.S. is one of uh, imperialism and empire, and there's no such thing as a just war. Uh, be it in Iraq or Vietnam, uh, all wars are for profit, so uh, that's, that's really it. And why I'm here is because innocent people are again being murdered by drones. They have a 2% success rate of hitting their target. 98% of the people killed are labeled as collateral uh, damage, which include women and children. In Pakistan and Yemen alone, there's, I think, 270 children murdered uh, over two years. Uh, you know, I, I have kids. I couldn't imagine falling asleep at night uh, worrying about a missile coming through my house and killing them. But these people live with this every single day, and no one talks about the PTSD that uh, they, they have to live through or the anxiety that that brings. So while it, it's, it's great to call attention to innocent people being murdered, there's also a lot of other things that... Um, people have to face that, that are living in areas where they have constant surveillance under drones. So. Thank you very much for that and again such strength and class and again thank you very much for being here all four of you. Um, that was Gary Eggleston from Iraq Veterans Against the War. Um, back to you Barry um, and to basically anybody who wants to bounce off but I want to just ask you why drones and then in particular if um, what, what effect do you think your presence in, you know in its large numbers as, as veterans has or hoping it has on the drone pilots or military um, psyche or, or morale well I think drone that one of the problems uh, with drones I was reading an article that General McChrystal who was uh, in uh, in Iraq said that uh, he was concerned about the policy the drones because out of every terror supposed terrorist that we killed we created 20 additional terrorists and oh you know what's what's the uh, percentage in that we're creating more enemies around the world uh, and the, and it's 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 evident by any articles that you read about interviews with people in Pakistan and Yemen and uh, Somalia, you know, these people are terrorized just by the fact that drones are circling overhead. There are children who can't go to school, they can't sleep at night. And, and think about what that does to a whole 
group of people, a whole generation of young people growing up that the United States is there and that we're terrorizing, not just by dropping bomb or rockets and bombs on them, but the, the sheer presence and the humming noise above them is causing them to be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder.